All right. Hi, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm not sure why I woke up with a bit um, of a muted voice, but thank you all so much for having me today. Um, I'm a first year PhD student at CU Boulder. I study atmospheric chemistry and I'll be here for a pretty long time um, to complete my doctoral program, but I'm really grateful to be here. And I'm part of the Lutheran Campus Ministries and Bread and Belonging, where every Tuesday night, um, y'all graciously host us and we get to have a meal together and experience some really life-giving community. So before I moved here to Boulder and to Colorado, um, I went to college in the San Francisco Bay Area at UC Berkeley, and I also studied chemistry there. And then before that, um, I grew up in San Diego, California, in a little town by the beach. So I think that's pretty much where we'll start. So I didn't really grow up in the church, but I was baptized Presbyterian as a baby. When I was little, I remember my dad dragging my twin brother and I to the old people church on a smattering of Sundays, but what I mostly remember were the free donuts and the McDonald's Happy Meal we would get afterwards. I don't remember when or why we stopped going to church, but I think some aspects of faith get harder when life gets messy. My mom is a beautiful and fiercely loving woman who simultaneously struggles with addiction and her mental health. Some days my mom couldn't get out of bed, but we made the most of the days she could. Having grown up in San Diego, we spent countless weekends on the beach playing in the sand and the water. I think it was hard for my dad to take us to church without my mom there, as I'm sure he got questions from well-meaning church people like, where is your wife? Is she okay? I could imagine him saying things like, she's just a little tired this morning, the twins were up pretty late. While this wasn't always the truth, I wonder what it would have looked like if he did share some of what was really going on. Would they have understood? Would they have said some well-meaning platitude like, I'll keep her in my prayers? In my experience, the only thing more isolating than not talking about hard things going on in my life is talking about it with people who are not really interested in what I have to say. At its best, church can be a place where we bring our true and raw self to be met with other true and raw people. Oftentimes, though, we find ourselves afraid to come exactly as we are to a place we think is only meant for the already healed and already saved. Sometimes when people say they will pray for me and my family, it gives me solace, but more often it makes me wish they would take the time to sit with me in my pain because God can be found there too. Don't get me wrong. I believe in miracles and the power of prayer. I just don't think God is a divine vending machine that does moral calculus to decide what is given. There was once a time where I did believe this though. I began developing my personal faith in high school when my best friend who's a charismatic Christian brought me to a revival. There were people dancing in the spirit, speaking in tongues and prophesying over each other. People were brought up to the stage for healing of their broken hearts, their cancer, and scrapes on their legs from falling off their skateboards. People at the front touched the afflicted, and everyone in the back touched someone in front of them while we prayed. After the prayer, one after the other said that they were healed. I sincerely hoped that they were, but looking back, I wonder if they felt like they had to say that. For years after that, I thought that if you lived according to God's will, which people I trusted told me meant spreading the gospel, coming across as happy, keeping your sexuality within well-defined borders, and trusting that any painful thing that happened was just part of God's plan, then you would be blessed. I thought my prayers could heal my mom's addiction and that if it wasn't working, it was because I was not praying hard enough. I was told that if I brought my anxiety to God and God was pleased with me, it would be held and I would be healed. I thought that blessings were gifts from God for the good people of God and that the woes we experience happen when we are somehow outside of God's divine blessing. 
I wanted so badly for this to be true because it meant if I lived a good and honest life, then good things would happen to me and those that I loved. As I was developing this worldview, there were some cracks that started to form. When my friend David passed away from cancer in high school, and he went from a bubbly young man to a memory in a matter of months, I couldn't fathom how this could be part of God's plan. With prayer and counsel, I was convinced that there had to be a reason for the pain, and David's loss would somehow be redeemed. When I got to college at UC Berkeley, my perspective was challenged even more. Even though I got connected with a local church, volunteered in my community, and prayed every day, within my first semester, I was diagnosed with PTSD, my twin brother was kicked out of the college he was attending, and my parents were struggling at home. How could this be happening? How can a God who is supposed to heal and provide believers with blessing be doing this? To add to my confusion, there were still moments in the storm where I fought, felt God's undeniable presence. I felt God in the sun that still rose every morning, in the breeze coming from the San Francisco Bay that brought a smile to my face, and the laughter shared with my new friends. There are woes and there are blessings. Sometimes in life it is very clear which is which, but I think there's a particular beauty when these lines are blurred. Professor Kate Bowler, who got her PhD studying the prosperity gospel, which is what I have come to realize was something I definitely bought into, was living a seemingly perfect life until she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer at 35. In her book, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved, she says, I can't reconcile the way that the world is jolted by events that are wonderful and terrible, the gorgeous and the tragic. Except I am beginning to believe that these opposites do not cancel each other out. I see a middle-aged woman in the waiting room of the cancer clinic, her arms wrapped around the frail frame of her son. She squeezes him tightly, oblivious to the way he looks down at her sheepishly. He laughs after a minute, a hostage to her impervious love. Joy persists somehow, and I soak it in. The horror of cancer has made everything seem like it is painted in bright colors. I think the same thoughts again and again. Life is so beautiful. Life is so hard. Deconstructing and reconstructing my faith meant letting go of my ideas of where God is and where God isn't. I have learned to lean into the questions I have and remember that God is big enough to handle them. Something my college pastor used to say is that it is bold for us to assume that there is anywhere God isn't. God is here or she is nowhere. Sometimes people say that when we are hurting, we must turn to God. I want to challenge this and say that there is nowhere we can go that God has not already been. Wherever we are, God is with there also. God is with us there also. God is in the pain, the joy, the longing, and everywhere in between. As I imagined Jesus offering his sermon with the blessings and the woes, I wanted to offer some additional blessings from a sermon Pastor Nadia Boltzweber gave on the Beatitudes. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are they who doubt, those who aren't sure, who can still be surprised. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are the mothers of the miscarried. Blessed are those who no one else notices, the kids who sit at the middle school lunch tables, the guys at the hospital, the sex workers and the night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the teens who have to figure out ways to hide the cuts on their arms. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are the foster kids and the special ed kids and every other kid who just wants to feel safe and loved. Blessed are they who can't fall apart because they have to keep it together for everybody else. As college continued, I took some bold steps towards growing into myself and into my faith. I recognized that to best take care of my family and friends, I first needed to take care of myself. There was also so much freedom in recognizing that my mom's sobriety is not contingent on my life choices. When I see friends in pain, instead of immediately offering solutions, I have learned to spend some time entering the pain with them. In community, pain can be divided and joy can be multiplied. 
Our woes can coexist with our blessing without canceling each other out. In closing, I wanted to share a blessing that was also said a lot in my college ministry. And it goes, if you ever feel alone in your blessings and your woes, know that you are never really alone because the God who put the universe into motion and breathed you into being loves you today and every day, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lindsay.